Chapter 60, Monday, May 18th, 1778. I worked through the night to clean the dining room, prepare the breakfast, and steal the food we'd need for our journey. When I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer, I laid my head on the kitchen table and slept for a few hours. Isabel was taken aback to find me there in the morning. What? I put my finger to my lips and pulled her into the larder with me. Even there, behind a closed door, I whispered. We don't have much time, I said. What about the key? She asked. It's, uh, her face fell. It didn't work, did it? I grasped her arm tighter. We have no choice. We have to leave. But how? You have to write two notes. Make the first one look like it came from headquarters requesting the presence of Bellingham and the other gentlemen. Tell them to arrive before eight o'clock. But I haven't written anything in ages. He's sure to notice my script. I'll spill tea so that it's difficult to read. I'll say the messenger told me what it contained. What's the second note for? To tell them about Gideon. They, that he gave news of the army, army and the Congress to the British. Why do you care? She asked. It doesn't matter who wins the war. I think it does. Write the note, please. We'll leave it out so they can find it after we're gone. We should wait a bit after they depart. They're forever forgetting things. She nodded. Then what? Then we follow the river toward the camp and wait for our luck to turn. Many girls and lads would have been overcome by fear at that moment and blubbered or backed out of the plan. Not Isabel. The reverse side of her pig-headed stubbornness was unshakable courage that was worthy of a general. If our luck doesn't turn for the good of one's own, she said, we'll make it turn. The early part of my scheme unfolded better than I had hoped. Bellingham and the others had already been inclined to join the farewell to Lafayette's troops, so the note Isabel penned, dripping with tea and suitably smudged, was well received. But Mrs. Green declined to join them, for she was still feeling poorly. She asked if Isabel might stay with her, and Bellingham agreed. We had gotten rid of one obstacle, and it was replaced with another. I brought the horses to the front of the Moore Hall and handed Mr. Bellingham his gloves. Would you care to accompany us, he asked me, to witness the troops leaving? No instant fal falsehood appeared in my mind. I covered my hes hesitation by petting the horse's nose. If it's all the same, sir, I finally said, I've had my fill of watching soldiers. Bellingham stopped in the middle of putting on his gloves. I find that hard to believe. I dropped my gaze to the ground. In truth, sir, I've been neglectful of mucking up the barn. I wouldn't want General Green to find it in its current state. He looked for a moment as if he was going to question me further. If he did, I'd lead him to a tour of the rather odiferous stalls. Very well. He gave, me the, he gave the glove a tug, gathered the reins in his hands, and mounted the horse. You must become more diligent about your chores, Curzon. Caring for the horses is every bit as important as caring for the gentlemen who ride them. Yes, sir, I bowed as he rode off with his companions. We went about our regular duties for an agonizing half hour, Isabel washing up and me making a half-hearted effort in the barn. When I could stand it no longer, I hung up the shovel and went into the house. Isabel had just finished preparing a breakfast tray for Mrs. Green, a full teapot and de delicate cup and saucer, the leftover biscuits, a wedge of sharp cheese, and a pot of blackberry preserves. It also held a dusty bottle of cordial and a large wine glass. I'll try to get her to drink the whole thing, Isabel said. Then, maybe she'll sleep. I did not think it lightly, likely, but it didn't matter either way. Even if Mrs. Green noticed we had fled, there was no horse for her to ride to camp upon, and it was unlikely she'd walk that distance. When Isabel went in to care for Mrs. Green, I entered Bellingham's bedchamber and stole the paper money from his traveling chest and the two gold coins hidden in a folio of, tr of old letters. He called the coins his emergency treasure trove. If any situation was an emergency, this was it. I was tempted to rummage through his belongings and steal more clothes, but the thought of wearing something that had been on, on his form was sickening. I dropped the note about Gideon's betrayal in the center of the bed, closed the door behind me, and hurried down to my sleeping shed. It took only a few moments to remove the clothing that had been tailored for me in York, Bellingham would describe my waistcoat, coat, and breeches in the runaway advertisement. He would carry them with us and burn them the first chance we had. The stockings and shirt were less remarkable, so these I placed in an old potato sack, along with my blanket. 
I dressed myself in the tattered shirt, breeches, and the coat that I'd been wearing the day I walked into Moore Hall for the first time. In to the kitchen, I went. My mind raced down the list of actions I'd thought about all night, ticking them off one after the next like they were drill commands. Clothes changed, money secured, house in good order. This was necessary because it might help delay the search for us. Gentlemen departed, food. My thoughts were cut short as Isabel hurried into the kitchen and closed the door that led the hall. Laudanum, she grinned. I couldn't speak. Don't worry, she said. I didn't force a sleeping po potion on her. She'd already taken it, quite a big dose, to relieve her headache. She'll sleep the day away. What's wrong? Why are you looking at me like that? I pointed, still speechless. Isabel wore breeches. I'd never before seen how breeches allowed one to gaze upon the entire length of the leg of a wearer, as well as a good eyeful of that person's rump. When boys or men wore breeches, I'd not taken notice of this. But with the breeches upon Isabel, it was all I could think of. She looked down on her legs. My mother would thrash me if she ever saw me like this. Truth be told, it's an odd sensation. But I like this jacket. You should be more covered than that. I don't want to be. It's nice to walk like this. Odd, but nice. I think you should put your skirt back on and... Shh, Isabel froze. Did you hear that? I listened, but there was nothing. The sun's warming up the house, that's all, I said. If not your skirt, then a long greatcoat. No, Isabel said, relaxing from her fright. Wearing a coat on a day as warm as this will draw more attention to me. I sighed. We don't have time to argue. Let's just go. Another loud creak came from the hall, but it was not the wooden side of the house. The door of the hall swung open. Bellingham stood there. He pointed his pistol at Isabel. You're not going anywhere, he said. Chapter 61 It is true what they say. When you find yourself in circumstances that are too horrible to behold, like on a battlefield or in a kitchen with a man holding a gun, time changes and you notice the strangest of things. His boots were muddy. He was breathing hard. He must have tied up his horse down the road, then run the rest of the way so he would not be alerted. Bellingham was not at all accustomed to running. I knew you'd try this, he said. I saw how you reacted when you heard she was sold. And this morning? Sweat trickled down the side of his face. His eyes burned like those of a hungry wolf. You turned down the chance to go to headquarters and watch the troops. That was very unlike you, Curzon. His eyes shook a bit from the weight of the barrel. Bellingham was not at all accustomed to guns, either. Isabel, you are going to find me some rope, and then you are going to sit on a chair with your hands folded in your lap, he ordered. No, she's not. I stepped toward him. Stay right there, Bellingham warned. I took another step. I don't want to. A third step, and I was only four paces away from him, close enough to make him nervous. He pointed the pistol at my belly, as I had hoped. Run, Isabel, I said. Ride his horse until it drops. She fled out the kitchen door without a word. How noble, sneered Bellingham. Stupid, but noble. Do you think I won't be able to track her down? I did before, several times. She's not very good at hiding herself. His hand shook even more. It had a pinkish hue, like the rest of his skin, hands that had never seen the sun had never chopped wood or manned bellows or loaded a wagon. I stepped closer. That's far enough, he said. Put your hands above your head. I did, slowly. Everything was slow, but loud. The sound of my heartbeat in my ears, Bellingham's ragged breathing, the clock in the parlor ticking away the minutes. Was she far enough away yet? Could I risk it? Mr. Bellingham, sir, I said, slowly. If I may. Are you coming to your senses, ready to beg at my forgiveness? He chuckled and smiled broadly, showing all of his teeth. I stared. There were no black specks on his lips or between his teeth. His tobacco-colored breeches were spotless, too, except for a few drops of mud near the knee, likely from when he dismounted in a hurry. The sleeves of his coat were still as clean as when I'd brushed them, and the cuffs of his shirt were bright. Actually, no. I wondered what you thought of the taste 
I wondered what you thought of the taste, but realized you didn't have the chance, did you? What taste? He frowned. Have you lost your wits, boy? I took one more step and f tapped on my front tooth. Your teeth are very clean. I said that's far enough, he roared, not making any sense of my words. I will shoot you, Corzon, I swear. The pinkness of his hands and the clean cleanliness of his breeches and his cuffs and his teeth all bespoke one thing to me. He had not ripped open a gunpowder cartridge. He had not loaded the pistol. But I could have been wrong, which is why I prayed Isabel was on that horse and galloping away. I took one more step and reached for the gun. He pulled the trigger. The flint hit, hit the empty firing pan. Click. Time sped up to normal and then ran ahead of itself. I grabbed at the gun. He pulled it backward and we were both off balance, crashing against the door frame and then spinning across the kitchen floor and onto the table. I released the gun and punched his head, which hurt more than I imagined it would. He cursed and tried to hit me with the gun, but I leaned away just in time, and instead of the heavy pistol gouged and said the heavy pistol gouged the table. I shoved him at the same time that he pulled, and we regained our feet, grappling with each other. We staggered and crashed against the shelves, sending crockery and boxes to the floor. Something hit me square in the head. The room tilted and the air burned, and I had the sudden urge to puke. My legs gave out, and I fell. Bellingham stood over me, breathing hard. That was a mistake, boy. The gun had disappeared. In his right hand, he held a knife. Somebody gave a shout, and the door slammed against the wall. Bellingham didn't have time to turn around before the broad set of a shovel blade cracked against his head. His eyes rolled up, and he fell to the ground with a grunt. Isabel stood over him, holding the shovel like an axe. Did I... I crouched by the still form. He's still breathing. Want me to hit him again? I tugged at Bellingham's neckcloth. I have a better idea. I fished out the cord that Bellingham wore around his neck, using the knife on the floor to slice it, and stood up, holding the key. Hurry, Isabel said. The key fit perfectly. I twisted it and the lock opened. I took it out, then gently opened the iron collar and freed Isabel. Chapter 62, Monday, May 18th, 1778. It was tempting to leave Bellingham on the floor and run, but we needed to make sure we'd have enough time to escape. First, we'd carried him out to the barn, where we trussed him up good, tying up, tying his hands and feet with rope. We ran a leather strap through the ring at the end of his iron collar before we locked it around his neck. This strap I fastened to an overhead beam, leaving enough length that Bellingham could sit or lay on the ground but keeping him tethered inside the barn. We used his own neck cloth to wrap around his mouth so his shouts would not carry far and took the key with us. The confusion and crowd had started at headquarters. Soldiers shouting, soldiers laughing, soldiers ready for war. The fellows had forged themselves into an army that was ready to march and take its country back. A part of my heart was gladdened, but most of me was desperate. Every moment we stayed gave Bellingham another chance to escape. I asked a few questions of the fellows milling about. There had been some disagreements between the junior officers of Lafayette's force, and that was why the troops, troops had not yet left. I explained this to Isabel as we made our way toward Sullivan's Bridge, keeping at the edges of the crowds, hats pulled low on our heads. We wormed our way past, we wormed our way until we were on the south side of the gathering, putting several thousand bodies between us and anyone who might come riding down from Moore Hall. All at once, the drums started rattling, and commands were being shouted. The crowd quickly thinned as the fellows who were staying in the camp backed away from those who were leaving. "'What are we going to do?' asked Isabel. "'Greenlaw's company is in here somewhere,' I said. "'Keep looking.' Another order was shouted. "'Forward!' The captains and sergeants echoed down the ranks, and 4,000 boots moved toward the bridge, with Lafayette at the head, followed by the Unitas and the, the, the first company of Continentals." The men were not forced to march with the precision of Baron von Steuben's drills. Those were reserved for the battlefield. But the companies walked together. We could not just walk along. We could not just walk alongside them. We needed to belong somewhere to have safe passage. I scanned the lines of men, not bothering to hide my face any longer. Master Stone Thrower! Shouted a familiar voice. I looked at the mass of moving soldiers, but they all had their backs to us. 
Suddenly, a long arm shot up from the center of the crowd, the hand waving a hat like a signal flag. Follow me, I told Isabel. Don't say a word. We fought past hundreds of fellows, with me loudly sh muttering things like, Pardon me. Beg pardon. Sarge is going to kill us. Shoes fell apart. Beg pardon. As we bumped and squeezed our way to the section where Sergeant Greenlaw's company was walking. A bad day to be late, Private, Luke Greenlaw scolded. Privates? Isabel opened her mouth and I kicked her ankle. Shh, I reminded her. The breeches, coat, and large brimmed hat would not shield her at all if she, was open, if she were to open her mouth. Isabel's voice would never be mistaken for a boy's. If she was overheard by an officer from a different company, our goose would be cooked. All right, lads, said Greenlaw. You know what to do. The company rearranged itself, one fellow lagging behind for a moment, another stepping to the side, until they had formed a box around us that shielded us from sight. Faulkner and Edwards leaned forward to give me a wave and went wide-eyed at the sight of Isabel in her remarkable breeches, which made me laugh. We marched onto the bridge. Looking back, I know it couldn't have been longer than 30 or 40 paces. It felt like 40 miles. With every step, I wanted to turn around to see if there were men on horseback searching for us, but to do so would give them a look on my face. I glanced one once at Isabel. Her eyes were forward, her, her jaw set firm. She did not look back. Here, I slipped her the key. She grinned and threw it over our heads of the lads and into the river. I laughed then, walking out of Valley Forge the way I walked into it, with my friends.